Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in the last few lectures of guitar amplification and effects, we've been looking at the first preamp stage of the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier. In this lecture, we're going to look at the third stage, which has some really interesting properties. So as far as the capacitors go, I'm going to assume that we can short this capacitor here at AC, this 20 nanofarad capacitor, and when we're playing these kinds of games, I'm going to assume that we can just open up this one nanofarad capacitor. This is a typical thing you do. You short the capacitors that are in series with the signal. You open up the capacitors that are in parallel with the signal. Later in the class, we'll look at ways of dealing with the capacitors directly and talking about their effect on the frequency response. So the folks at Mesa Boogie conveniently labeled the plate to ground voltage as 384 volts and the grid to ground voltage is five volts. But let's assume that we don't know this. We're gonna to try to derive these quantities. Although, as we'll see, this gets a little bit sticky. So something that's particularly interesting about this is that there's no bypass capacitor on the cathode in any form. So the first stage that we looked at last time and this stage here, that's the second stage, and I guess this is the fourth stage, Notice these have bypass capacitors. They also have a couple of variations for different gain settings. So you can either completely bypass the cathode or get these resistances in parallel. But this third stage doesn't offer any of that. And this cathode capacitor, 39K, that's huge. That's way bigger than you would have in a standard common cathode stage. So we already know that something interesting and weird is happening with this stage. Before we go on, I'll notice that this 220K resistance between our 330K grid leak resistor for the following stage and the grid of the following stage, this is something we haven't really seen. This is called a grid stopper resistor, and we'll talk about that another time. It doesn't really affect the analysis we're gonna do now. So here is our circuit. And to compute the DC bias points, we can get rid of the capacitors, open those up. And in order to draw a load line, as we talked about previously, we need two points. Two convenient points are the case where there's no current flowing at all, so there's no voltage being lost across the resistors, and the entire power supply of 406 volts is being lost across the triode. I should mention I got this 406 volts number from another part of the schematic that shows the power supply. So we need another point, and for that we can imagine the point where none of the voltage drops across the triode and all of it is dropping across the resistors. So I can use Ohm's law and find that that turns out to be 2.9 milliamps. So this gives me two points I can plot on my chart. So down here on the lower right, I have 406 volts. In the upper left-hand corner, I have 2.9 milliamps. And what we now need to do is figure out how to draw a grid line that we can intersect with this to figure out the DC operating point. So let's play around with grid line values. Now, I'm going to cheat just a little bit Notice that Mesa Boogie wrote five volts here, so that suggests to me that they think the grid to cathode voltage should be minus five volts. So I'm gonna go ahead and start there. I know I said that we're gonna ignore these, so I cheated a little bit, whatever. Anyway, if we plug in minus five volts for our grid to cathode voltage into this kind of formula that we computed previously, we get minus five volts over this giant resistor of 39 kilo ohms, giving us 0.128 milliamps. Let's try something nearby. So let's try minus 4.5 volts. If I plug that in, well, I get something almost identical. I get 0.115 milliamps. The weird thing about drawing this grid line is that this resistance is so big, your grid line is pretty close to a horizontal line. So this is 0.1 something something something. And when we go to try to plot that on this graph, this is really tricky because 0.1 is here, 0.2 is here, so this is like 0.15. So if you want something like 0.11 or 0.12, it's really 
hard to distinguish it from this 0.1 milliamp line. So I'm just going to draw a line at that 0.1 mark. I tried to draw it like one pixel higher to indicate it's 0.11. I don't know. Anyway, going between this minus 4.5 and minus 5. As I said, it's essentially a horizontal line. Technically, it's not exactly horizontal, but it's pretty darn close. So if we take a look at that and figure out what the operating point is for the plate to cathode voltage, we get something like 390 volts. Okay, that's nice. I probably should have put a little Q here to indicate that this is the quiescent voltage and not some generic plate to cathode voltage. Anyway, what about the quiescent current? Well, that's 0.1 something, something, something. It's hard to really distinguish any further than that. And this is deeply strange. Mesoboogie has chosen an extremely low bias current. Usually you would be biasing your amp somewhere up here. And the reason for that is that then you have a nice symmetric swing on either side. Notice down here the various grid to cathode curves start to bunch up. If you're operating up here, they're more or less evenly spaced. But down here at these low currents, as you drop the grid to cathode voltage, these grid lines get closer together. This is going to give you some asymmetric distortion. And this is a clue that this is not trying to be a linear amplifier. This is deliberately being used as a wave shaping mechanism. To get a better sense of what's going on, think about these transconductance curves. So here we have curves that show the current as a function of the grid to cathode voltage four different values of the plate to cathode voltage. In that first stage of the Mesa Boogie that we looked at last time, we had a 0.9 milliamp quiescent plate current, and I think we had a plate to cathode voltage of 200 volts. So that's operating somewhere in here. Notice this is reasonably approximated as a straight line, but this particular amplifier, this third stage amplifier, it's operating down, I think here. So this would be 0.1 milliamps. And now I don't even really have an appropriate plate to cathode voltage plot here. It's operating somewhere, I don't know, something like here. Oh, oh, ignore that. That was terrible. Anyway, <laughs> 0 0.1 milliamps. It's operating somewhere in this region where there's definitely an asymmetry going each direction. So this is going to distort more on one side of the waveform than the other. This kind of amplifier with this bias set so low is often referred to as a cold clipper. I don't like that term clipper. You really need to put clipper in air quotes there because it's not like a harsh diode clipper. It's not like instantly brick walling on one side, but it is definitely smushing up. So I ran into a little bit of a problem here trying to match what I computed with what's on the schematic. So these are basically test point values that somebody like Mesa Boogie would write on here. So a tech that's repairing the amp knows the kinds of voltages they should be expecting. And probably I should do a whole other lecture on high voltage safety because 5 volts isn't a problem, but 384 volts that is a problem. Coming into contact with that, if you also wind up having a decent path to ground somewhere on your body, you are in for a world of hurt. So if you are testing something like this, what you want to do is you want to alligator clip it, connect it to your DC voltmeter, and do all of that while the thing's off, and it's been off long enough for the power supply capacitors to drain out. Then you flip the thing on, and then you take your measurement, and then you turn the thing off and you wait for those power supply capacitors to drain again, then you can go get your alligator clip. Don't go poking around the amp with your fingers involved while the amp is live. So I said, okay, let's try to compute what the bias point would be if we use these values that are on the schematic. Well, one of these I already used. It was that grid to cathode voltage of minus five volts. Dividing by 39 kilo ohms, gives me an operating point of 0 0.128 milliamps. Now, if I believe what's on the schematic, then the plate to cathode operating voltage is 384 minus five volts, giving me 379 volts. Now, if I plot this point on that set of plate characteristics, 
I wind up with something here. So this 0.128, again, I don't have any way of drawing that in any more detail, so I just kind of put it at the 0.1 mark. 379, okay, let's round that for the purposes of plotting. So it gives us a point that's here. And the thing that confuses me is that the grid to cathode minus 5 volt line is way over here. So if I were to assume that this was the actual grid to cathode voltage and assume that this was the operating current, well, that would give me a plate to cathode operating voltage someplace up here. That's higher than the power supply voltage. So something's a little off somewhere. Because if you look at the chart itself, this suggests that the grid to cathode voltage is more like minus 4.5. But then, of course, using that would scoot this a little bit, although not by much, by just 0.5 volts. So it would basically be in the same spot. Anyway, if I compare this point to what I computed earlier, well, earlier I computed 390 volts, and we figured out, okay, the current has to be 0.1 milliamp, something, 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 yada, yada, yada. So these are pretty close. But again, regardless of which one you want to pick, neither of these are close to that minus 5 volt indicated on the schematic. Let's see, this is probably something like minus 4.5. The one I computed might be something more like minus 4.6. Who knows? My theory is that we should probably trust this schematic. These are probably measured from a representative actual Mesa Boogie dual rectifier. I think discrepancies might come from the fact that whenever this sheet was prepared, remember this was many, many decades ago, probably this was not really drawn to accurately represent what was happening way down here, or for that matter, really intended to indicate accurately what's happening over here. So I'm more inclined to write this off to this particular graph not being exactly perfectly useful in those extremes. Even if it's not 100% right, it's definitely giving us something in the ballpark and giving us enough to start to develop an intuition for what this particular weird amplifier is doing. Notice something else really interesting about this circuit. We have a 1 mega ohm grid leak resistor. But the input doesn't go into it directly. It's actually going through this 470K resistor. So whatever the output of the previous stage is, it's getting attenuated by a resistive divider before it goes into this preamp stage. So this tube did a bunch of work trying to boost the signal. And then the designers promptly drop that with this network of resistors here. So let's see, I've got 470K, 1 mega ohm. So about a third of the output of this tube here is actually just getting tossed away. That further emphasizes that this tube isn't really being used for its amplification purposes per se. It's being used as a weird nonlinear wave shaper. So I'm not going to bother doing a small signal analysis on this because the whole point of this amplifier is that it's not operating in a linear fashion, and small signal analysis is all about linear analysis. I'll also mention that the Soldano Super Lead Overdrive has a cold clipper that's basically identical to the one in the Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier. The Marshall JCM800 has a cold clipper stage as well, although I don't think it's as extreme as the one we've been looking at in this lecture.